The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. When we're having a good day, the truth is we really don't need anybody. When everything is okay, you really don't need anybody. But when things break down, when things go wrong, when persecution comes, when all those things come, how many people have sat there and said, Lord, um, I need you, and I'm not sure how you're with me. I'm not sure if my prayer is good enough to be responded to. I'm not sure if I even deserve to be released from this, but I need you. In other words, it's almost like a desperate plea that we give. Now, if you've ever been in trouble for real, then you should know exactly what I'm talking about. It does not happen in a time of peace. In fact, in a time of peace, we can afford to act like anybody. Do you guys agree? Sometimes we'll say, hey, we're fine. But in truth, we're dying the entire time. When nothing is happening, when you're okay, when you have everything you want, if you were to stay like that, for the greater half of your life, that will be the time you would not be in close communication with the Lord. It's when things go wrong. Sometimes, when you look at somebody else's life and you have no power to help that person, you can find yourself in that same situation. You may be asking the Lord for strength, some sort of resolve to help somebody else out, right? And it's just not there. Now, I'm a regular person, right? So that means when things happen in my life. I wanted to know that the Lord was, was what's the procedure? Lord, what do I need to do to, uh, you know, get this thing moving? Where's my comfort? Truth be told, I'm hardly ever comforted in trouble. I don't look for comfort. I don't run to anybody. I don't do that. And all too often, it is me with the situation, with the Lord. And I look for him, and I won't let loose until I find him. In so doing, because I've gone through many moments like that, I found him, but it's in moments of peace. We're distant. How many did somebody said when my sons died? I went through that with a daughter at a very young age. She died, real young age, and it was different because I spent a lot of time. Right? It it puts you in this realm of, of questions. You know what's so fascinating is that the day after, you know what happened? The Lord gave me a truth. You know what that truth did? It caused me to smile. Do you know that? The day after, it caused me to smile. The day after that, it caused me to leap internally. You know, when most people lose something precious like that, they lash out at the entire world. They do. You see, I like truth and children that don't belong to us. We're blessed to be caretakers over souls that do not belong to us. They belong to the Most High. Those children are, in fact, your brothers and your sisters. They don't belong to you. But you were deemed to be their helper overseer, caretaker for a time, cherish that responsibility. Losses bring you closer to truth. They do not put you in a place which is like a wilderness. That's Hollywood. It's not real. What's real is when you face the truth. Right now, right? The world is in sort of a, this weird moment, correct? The world is. It's in a weird moment. People, they have no outlet for their losses. Look at the world and look at what's happening. You would think it's because of leadership. You would think it's because of the myriad of issues that we face. No, that's not why. People have no outlet. The only true outlet is truth. Drinking is not an outlet. Pharmaceutical recreational things is not an outlet. Nature's yield, grass, weed, things like this, not an outlet. All those things do is delay the inevitable. You know what the inevitable is. You know what that is? You have to face what just happened. You have to put in perspective what happened. That's very difficult for people these days. Do you know why? It's very hard. Like in my case, somebody asked me that today. They said, how can you, you, and this is somebody who knows me quite well, and God bless their souls, they are dusty and crusty like I am, but how can you have so many losses, and yet your joy is never tampered? How can that happen? This person wants to know. They are full of defeat. They tried to smile with so much losses. They tried to be kind and to be nice, dealing with so many losses. And so they asked me, how do you do that? You know what my answer was? My answer was this. In the middle of your troubles, 
that's when you ask that question. Never ask that in peacetime. Don't ask that question when everything is okay. You will not believe the answer. Losses can truly test us. They will let you know where you are. Lord knows I've lost hundreds of people. Lord knows. 300, over 300 close people. And they keep going. So for 300, can you imagine that? Having the loss of over 300 close people. Right? You know what it does though? Listen to me carefully. It causes you to see the truth. When you lose a person, the first thing you think is, oh, that person's gone. I won't see that person anymore. And it hurts. You may miss the person. When you lose another, same thing happens. You start losing other people. You're forced to see the truth. And what is that truth? That first and foremost, no one is promised tomorrow. There are too many people I've had plans with, right? In the future. They were not in the future. They never made it. When you deal with loss, you start facing the absolute truth. You know what that truth is? It's a very simple truth. People rebel against this truth. People fight and do everything they can to avoid this one truth. Do you know what that is? It's very simple too. You ready? Let God be God. Let God be God. How simple. How do you do that? That's when you see who the Father is and you realize, wait a minute, the Creator created everything. He created everything. The stars. He created all the elements. He created everything. We live within His creation. We are His creation. He made humanity with autonomy, with the ability to reproduce. He grants bodies, souls. It's His creation. We all too often forget that. And because it's His creation, like, for example, if I had a desk and say I had a bunch of electronic components on this desk and I had a capacitor that blew out. And if those electronic components could talk to one another, they may be sad because that capacitor blew out. They may miss the capacitor. So while they're missing the capacitor because I want the whole thing to work, I replace it with another. Take the old capacitor. They don't know my plans. All they know is what they see. They don't know that I crank the voltage up to see at what point that capacitor would blow. They don't know that. They don't know that that one capacitor actually tried the entire circuit. Even the ones that like that capacitor, just like us, we don't know that when we are close to someone and they pass, we're the ones undergoing a process, not the person who passes. The person who passes has finished their race. So why are you in proximity to the one who passes? Because you're the one undergoing something. Can you all see that? The person who passes is not undergoing anything. They have finished their race. But why are you around when the person passes? Because that was for you. That was your moment. That's going to lead to something. It is true that when you create something, all the different parts and everything that you make, they cannot create themselves. You have assembled them into something useful. And if you want that to continue to be useful, you assemble it with great care, just like you're made with great care. Great care. Everything you undergo in life, everything that you see in life is a bit different than you think. Some people think things are just in operation. I found that to be impossible. So discern, they found that out big time. They found out things that they, they can't, they don't want the answer to what they have found. Every time they discover something that implies it's been under control the entire time, they don't like it. They're trying to find, scientists have always been trying to find a key that states this element here just came out of a randomness or this element here simply exists and does a bunch of things to this element to cause this random thing over here. They do not like the idea that things are controlled. They don't like that. In the 80s, they found that out. In 2022, they proved it. 2023, they proved it. 2024, everybody proved it. How did they prove that? I'll give you a simple demonstration back to my conversation. There were some people in Japan on a mountain isolated from everything. How do we know this? They were inside of a mountain. There were people in the USA inside of a mountain. And that was on the East Coast right through one of the tunnels i believe when you're when you're uh, uh, going up towards pennsylvania from virginia right through one of those tunnels so you have one in one mountain one in another mountain no light can get to either one no radio signals nor anything else and they have some small tiny teeny tiny particles smalls now these particles are important because part, it, it will orientate itself 
based on the magnetic poles of the Earth, but they're opposites. So what does that mean? That means because they're opposites, only one of those group of elements, right? Japan had the mirror set. The USA had the dominant set. So, of course, it operated like we see normal, you know, things operate with magnetism. But the one in Japan operated opposite. The one in the USA, no matter what the poles were doing. Guess what happened when they moved? Each particle they moved, the particles in Japan at the exact same time, as though they were connected, also moved in the opposite direction. They kept doing it. They kept measuring to see if it was real. They found it was real. So one, you move one and the other one responds with the opposite movement. They went further. They stuck one on the ISS, right? Random places here on Earth. They had the master copy here on Earth. They had the mirror version on the ISS. Same thing happened. They swapped them. Same thing happened. They put them close. Same thing happened. They put them far apart. Same thing happened. And this is natural. Can you imagine having a, having a golf ball, right? You move one golf ball counterclockwise, and the other golf ball moves clockwise. Same, um, same angle. Same speed, same force, same everything. Then you move it again and it happens again. At the exact same time as though they're connected by some unknown force. You can't get a hold of, but there is no force that can interrupt them. And they found something larger. By the way, that experiment took place a long time ago. They've had others. Oh, they've stuck stuff. You know, these are, uh, uh, these are uh, like, like the James Webb telescope. Do you not know that they have a packet, very special packets from these telescopes? Do you not know that they continue to measure this same phenomenon? And it works no matter the distance. They know that by voyage. They know that through all spacecraft that have been launched. Because a packet only weighs half an ounce. And that's the container that houses the particulate and the sensors, of course. So that means, wait, that means if you control one particle, the other particle responds at the exact same time with the exact opposite movement, no matter where it's at. Then they found out the master element does things on its own. In fact, they found out all elements do things on their own. So with the first theorem now proven, it's like a theorem, and it's proven, they found out other things are connected the same way, but they don't know where the control spot is. Who has the master elements? They don't know. They're finding out the same things at CERN. And they're trying so desperately to unlock what the control element is to these forces. They can find the exact same forces all day. See, when they keep running the same experiment over and over and over and over and over again, at some point you'll say, well, what are they doing? They're not doing anything. What if they're just running the same experiment over and over again. No, these guys are hunting. They are looking. They need the control element. You know what that means? That means if you can somehow take control over the control element, You'd be the most powerful person on this earth. You could reverse anything you wanted to reverse on this earth. You could cure anything you wanted to cure. You could do the unbelievable if you could find out where the control element is. And they're hunting and they'll never stop. They're not going to stop. They're hunting desperately. Are they close? No closer than they were, you know, yesterday. They're hunting them. That, that's partly why they have that statue up there. That's what that statue stands for. Why? These same experiments are in the old writings in India. Yes, that means India. Believe it or not, those people in India are the smartest people on the planet. Just so you know that. They have a mental capacity to do things the average person cannot do because they have a strong desire in certain areas. That's why. Your brain is no different than theirs. The truth is, each and every one of you could be super intelligent if you so desire but somebody asked me something. What's in the way of your super intelligence? Anybody who did terrible in school, if you did terrible in school, but you're not, you know, you're not dumb or anything. You just didn't do good in school. Don't you remember why? I know why you did terrible in school. Do you know why? If you did terrible in any specific subject, I know why you did that. Now, you may argue in front of everybody else. You may. If you want to be right about it, but I'm telling you, I know why. I know why. You ready? Your emotions. That's why. That's why. Think about it. Pause. Take a pause. Think about it. Your emotions. What you were feeling. You got in the way. Stopped your concentration. Caused you not to commit. Right? Zapped your energy. You start thinking about other things trying to be stimulated in other areas of life. And that subject was not doing it. Emotions. 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 They had a test on emotions. They can actually zap you of your emotions where you don't have any. 
Do you know that? In other words, they can they can make you. You know, it's almost like your emotions go dormant. They can do this to anybody. This can be done to anybody. Now, in every single case, and they even work with them with people with real brain damage. People who were who had real damaged parts of the brain. Well, they cause the emotional sets and subsets to go away, to stop, to become dormant. The person had this incredible capacity to remember everything. This amazing thing. They had nothing to distract them from remembering everything and all of them drooled at the same time. Isn't that funny? They drooled. They actually drooled. So they would look at something. Right? Some of the people who couldn't read, instantly, they began to recall everything they saw previously. And they started putting things back together. Now, when they had that test on the, the, the mentally, they called them mentally retarded at the time, right? But they had that same test on them. Remarkable findings. Remarkable findings. Funny thing in it. Because emotions, that's how we, things stick in our memory. Think of the worst moment in your life. Isn't it something wrapped with a lot of emotions? Think about it. You can't forget it because of all the emotions. Think about it. It was an emotional time. And it just so happens that's what you remember. Think of the best time in your life. The best time in your life that stimulated everything within you. It may be a beautiful memory. You can't forget it. But here's the funny part. Do you remember how you felt during that time? I'll tell you what, you can only describe it. You cannot bring back all the emotions. Because if you brought back all the emotions, you would be back in that spot again. Like, like somebody hypnotized you. You would recall every single detail. Because the truth is, you've never forgotten anything you ever saw. You just can't recall it. Why? Because they found out it takes emotions to recall what you have seen. Creation is very direct. Do you know that? It is extremely direct with no embellishments. It is flawless and it executes every single day. We are the element in creation that gives it the flavor it has. We create that flavor. In the absence of flavor, what do we do? We spruce up things. For example, being saved. You know, when I was young, I used to hear people say, you, you should get saved. You, you need to get saved. And I'm going to ask myself in the head now, how do I know what this, I know what this is. I know you need it, but why is no one describing it? I honestly did. I said, there's all these people are speaking, but they're not telling me how to do it. Then they say, well, you got to get saved like this. You got to be believe in Jesus Christ and you have to say you're sorry for your sins and you're saved. And that wasn't enough for me. I said, that's not going to work either. They're not describing anything. You know what? The truth be told, the only time I found out the full process of how to be saved is when I read the word myself because nobody else told me. It is this version they had that everybody has heard, and I found it empty. Nowadays, a person will tell you, oh, I already know that. you got to be saved. I already know that stuff. How can anybody ever say that? When being saved is the whole point of God's word, when being saved is the whole point of creation, when being saved is the whole point of all the elements of creation. So you may not know this, but everything you see in space was created for your process. Now swallow that one for a minute. The sun, the galaxies, everything out there was created for your process. Everything, the bugs, the fish, the animals, everything created for your process. But the Lord tells us this very clearly. Here's the problem. The problem is, there are other elements in the earth. They do not like your father. They do not like my father in heaven. In fact, what did Jesus say? What did the Lord say about their love for the world? Do you guys remember what Jesus said about the world? I remember him saying, he said, if the world hates you, he said, then no one hated me before it hated you. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. The world's going to hate you. That's what Jesus said. The world's not going to like you because Jesus chose you. Hmm? That's what he said. He said that. Matter of fact, that's John 15, what, 18 through 20, I believe. Correct me later if I'm wrong about that, but I think it's somewhere near there. He speaks about that. He speaks very plainly. He speaks a monumental phrase. For some reason, people don't like to hear it. They don't like to hear it. Why don't they like to hear that? Why? Is that not the heart? Let me ask you guys something. Let me ask you, just, for, just because we're talking about, you know, people talk about logical things, we're talking about spiritual things. What is the number one commandment of Jesus? Can somebody tell me that? 
Somebody says, love, but what is it? Jesus said in John 15, he said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He said, these things I have spoken unto you that, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. He said, this is my commandment. What did he say? He said that in John 15, 12. He said, this is my commandment. Uh oh, he said, this is my commandment. You ready? That you love one another as I have loved you. Then he described it. Oh, here it comes. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, he said. If you do whatsoever I command you. He said, you're my friends if, this condition, if you do whatsoever I command you. That's very direct, isn't it? Jesus was so incredibly direct. Do you know how many times I've heard this preached? And it was not direct. It was full of worldly flavor. They decrease the love aspect or totally define it some weird way to excuse them to hate people in the world, to cover up for this foolish paradigm that people suffer from now, right? You know, because the enemy wants you to have a target. And so they, if, if you support the world in any way, you have to also teach people to have a target. You do. Just telling you, once we mature, we get rid of that. That's a common element with everybody on this earth except for some. I can honestly tell you, I think it was born against, I was born against those things that fight against love. I, th I think I was. There is no case in my life, no case in my life, that anybody can ever accuse me of hating them. There's no case in my life that that would ever happen. There's no case, there's no person in my life that could ever say, Mike, you disrespected me. Do you know that? No, no, that's pretty odd, right? That means I ate all sorts of crow. That's what it means. But, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. What does that mean to you guys? All this is going full circle. What does that mean to you guys? He was, that's quite blunt, right? That's very direct. You can't describe that a thousand different ways. That's very direct. What does that mean? That you lay down your life for your friends? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? You know, you, you just die for someone? Because if it means that, that is so easy. Do you know how easy it is to die for someone? Do you know how easy that is? That is so easy. But every time Jesus mentioned that word die, it was a prefix to his conversation. See, sometimes when he mentioned that word die, die meant, especially in this case, to lay down your life for your friends. That term, lay down your life. Many people associate that with death. So when I said, how do you die for your friends? That's not what he was saying, was it? He said, lay down your life. Oops, now that's hard. Most people say, you die for your friends, no greater love than that. But that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Laying down your life is not easy. It is an act of love. It can only be done by way of love. Do you know that? It cannot be done any other way. So let me explain that to you. Suppose I'm conversating with someone. They start to argue about a scripture. They get a little smirky with it, something like that. Right? Now, suppose I know I'm right. And the person I'm talking to is a, he indeed is a friend in that conversation. We already know that if you continue on that track of arguments and one win over against the other, that's, uh, that's, that's no good. What's it going to prove? Nothing. You know, I've heard so many people say, well, I had to tell them the right thing. Sure you did. No, you wanted them to know and you wanted to stick up for yourself to the last moment because you thought you were right. And any time a person thinks they're right, for the most part, they think they have a right to say that they're right, correct? I hear that a lot these days. We have rights. I have a right to do this and a right to do that. Well, then do this and that. Stop telling everybody you have a right to do it and do it. So in an argument like that, suppose you're really right, you know you're right, and you, your friend needs to know the right way. But for some reason, they believe in a corrupted way. How would you lay yourself down? How would you lay your life down for that friend in that matter? Well, to lay your life down is to cease isn't it? When you lay your life down, that means you stop your way of doing things. You have abruptly halted your way of doing things. Because see, when you die, you abruptly halt your way of doing anything. Your way of breathing, seeing, and everything else, you're gone. Your way never interrupts anybody else. So when you lay down your life for someone else, aren't you surrendering your lifestyle, your way of living, your way of communication, your way of everything for the sake of somebody else. Can you see it? 
that's pretty that's not so easy to do is it and you can only do that when you truly do love someone which is the amazing part somebody says silence nope silence is not laying your life down for somebody else it isn't I, it, it'd be nice if it was but that's not the deal no when somebody thinks they're right on scripture i do it all the time i engage people i will not exercise my way over them when you love someone right you want them to have the rightful answer now listen i never assume i can read this right to you but i'm not assuming i'm right about what i'm saying i want you to have the truth have you noticed something about me i want people to have the truth so much it must never come from me i want you to have my truth i want you to have the truth so what do i do i point you to a direction don't i i may say something that captures your attention you say hey let me go look at that i, I didn't i never saw that before let me go find it. what do you do you go back to the word of god i don't point you to me i don't want you coming to me what, why would i do that because listen if i care about you and you're broken i'm going to take you to the one who can fix everything that means you cannot come to me i want to show you where he is because if you find out where he is he's the one that can truly fix everything about you he can see i know when you know that you don't want people coming at you you don't want that you want people going to the source to christ so out of love there have been lots of times i have surrendered many things so a person can actually find christ see all too often we are in the way and in that act of love you can surrender lots of things so that that person can find out who christ is somebody had that uh, that conversation about drinking a while back and they said well drinking is a sin right well i don't believe that i believe the word of god i do the bible says you know you're not to drink to the point of drunkenness you're supposed to be sober of mind you're not supposed to indulge in strong drink and all that stuff true but it's another fact that wine is good for you but guess what i do not drink and i will not touch any type of alcohol of any type do you know why is it because i don't like wine no that's not it i've had wine before i've had champagne before i've had it some of this stuff is good never touch it that was my decision when i was a young one it remains my decision today do you know what there it is little daddy i don't want others to stumble see if somebody sees me drinking wine and i care about that person and the bible says we have to abstain from all appearances of evil that's an unselfish thing which means there's nothing wrong with wine but i'm not going to cause a little one to slip to see me drinking wine and i cannot go through all the principles dealing with that drinking of wine don't ever happen a lot of people do lots of things and they say well, i'm doing it anyway there's nothing wrong with it if they don't like it they can just go somewhere else that's not laying down your life for your friends that's not what that is laying down your life for your friends is when you can truthfully take something that could be harmless and not do it for the sake of somebody else there's another term for that it's called selfless service selfless service you're not the benefactor of your labor it's very easy right very direct now why is that not well understood these days we're talking about the inability of a lot of people but hear me carefully on this to stick with programming because they want the computer to do what they want the computer to do and when an error comes up they get irritated well this computer is just now it's not doing what i want it to do i've heard people say well this you know they were just writing a simple document and you know what one person said they said i can't believe you have to start up microsoft word with the mouse it shouldn't be that way that's what this person said so clearly they do not like the standards they can't submit themselves to things and when people make utterances like that they're not very good at submitting period unless they have some sort of advantage by doing it but when it comes to submitting themselves to somebody else's authority where they gain nothing they don't want to do it they want to be right about everything those people are the ones who don't like technology and it's very simple it's because they're unwilling to bend in their own personal ways i used to hear people say you know well i'm outspoken somebody said that in cot one time and they were proud and i said please don't don't say that that's hard well what do you mean it's hard see because satan is pretty cruel in his tricks so here's how it works you guys come up in life and you suppress your ideas your thoughts your opinions about things somebody in your family or somebody close to you has told you to shut up one too many times and when they did this nobody listened to a word you have to say there were times in your life when you were excited about something you couldn't share it with a soul do you know that's that's very unhealthy mentally there were times in your life when you couldn't share anything 
because somebody would always tell you that your ideas are garbage. Go sit down. We don't want to hear it. And they would gladly listen to somebody else with something dumber. Right, wouldn't they? Right in front of your face. So they wouldn't listen to you, but they would listen to Uncle Fester. Right? That's what they would do. And so when you grow up, that becomes an issue. When you come into the body of Christ and you're freed and you find out about salvation, all of a sudden you, you find out you belong to a bigger family. But in that bigger family, there's a mistake that's made because of no counseling. Here it is. A lot of people are bruised when they come into the body of Christ. There's no secret about that. Here's the problem. When you come into the body of Christ, into your new family, all too often, you don't want it to be like your old family. Your old family didn't want to hear a word you had to say. So in your new family, you have to give a daily resume to everybody to qualify yourself behind everything you say so that they know you know what you're talking about because you don't want your new family telling you to go be quiet. So it's this unspoken thing that rises up. And when somebody says something or insinuates that you're wrong, offense comes in. Why? Because if you're old family, that's why. So in other words, you're letting the pain from the old family ruin your new family. Pain, the wounds from your old family, is causing you potentially to inflict damage with or to your new family. Because nobody ever told, nobody tells people enough, hey, that quirky idea you had, that was pretty awesome. Continue to be the way you are. See, not a lot of people will tell you you're appreciated the way you are right now. Your quirkiness, if you study, you stutter. If you can't pronounce something, you can't pronounce it. If you can't spell, you can't spell. If you can spell, good for you. Whatever the deal is, you're fully accepted. Nobody tells people that enough. You know what they always do? They always like to correct the other person, but why? I'll tell you why. Because they were hurt in their other families. And when you're hurt in your other families, you want to be accepted in your new family. Because when you come to Christ, you say, wow, there are others like this. There, there's, there, there's a lot of people who believe in Christ. I have a family, a real family. Now I got to show them who I am. I got to show them my worth. No, you don't. You're fully accepted for who you are. And because the power of the Holy Spirit is real, your qualifications are already known. You need not prove a thing. Just be 100% yourself and continue to grow with Christ. And they don't know that. Who you are is the beautiful person. Not who you're trying to be. Who you are. The same person that those people in the world hated, wanted you to change, told you to put away, locked him up and threw away the key, that same person is the adorable person. That is the person of wealth. That is the person the body of Christ needs. That's why the world wanted you to suppress everything about yourself. That's why you have religious people around you. I, I know certain people who have been around religious people so much. They look for religious people. A person will say something, oh, that person sounds religious. What are you doing? I'm looking for people who have these ways. Because they'll come in and just ruin everything. Because it's, I know it's here somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it's here. Stop looking for it. Do the opposite. I can see a religious person. They start talking their religious rhetoric. Then I hear them say one statement. Join with the liberty of Christ and not lock on to it. And I'll take that one thing they said. They say, now you just said something right there. That was a blessing. I'll leave the rest of the stuff alone. I tend to see the good in a person. And I'll identify that good. Why? Because I understand we're all wounded. But some... They let those wounds fester. They guard those wounds. If you have a sore on your arm, say you get cut, you let that cut go for a week, it's going to be infected. It may not be life-threatening, but as soon as anything touches it, it's going to be tender, right? And so what do you end up doing? When somebody gets close to that tender sore, what do you do? You start shielding it. You protect it with everything that you are because you know if anybody touches it, it's going to hurt, correct? That's how people have come into the body of Christ. Anybody ever have a sore that was no big deal, but it was tender after about a week or so, and you hit it on something, you're like, what in the world is that? Anybody ever do that? It gets tender after about a week. That means it's infected. And so the slightest touch can make it hurt real bad. It could be the tiniest, tiniest little scrape. And you're wondering why in the world that thing hurts so much. It's infected. Go get some back team. Take care of it. People come into the body of Christ like and when we come in wounded, we're shield, we're guarding everything, guarding everything. And when we're guarding everything, we don't take everything in. We're very defensive. We're just like that. And so in our being like that, we find ourselves in complete why. We won't open up because we'll always say, I can't open up. Well, why not? Because I can't. Because I got hurt last time. You did. By who? By those people over there. We're not the people over there. We're the people over here. Who did you open up to? The people. Well, stop opening up the people. 
and open up to your Lord. God just told us something he missed. We talk about programming. We talk about everything is for you. And I just said something. You can put the motion right away. When you're guarding that tender spot and you want no one to touch it, you'll, all, you'll often tell people why you guard it after a while. You'll say those other people did that. Those people. What people? People I just came from, they did it. Well, guess what? We're not those people. By the way, if somebody's that close to a wound, what are you doing looking for stuff in other people? Oops, there it is. Do you know how many times people come into the body of Christ to find other people? They love the Lord, yes. They're looking for people to replace the people they lost. I have a different way. I have a method, you could say. Because people can't hurt me, and it's so funny, they just can't do it. There's a reason for that. I get backstabbed all the time. Nobody ever knows. Why? There's no effect to it. Why? I've had lots of wounds, and not one of you can touch it. Why? Why is it not tender to people? Because I'm not looking to people to repair anything about me. I'm looking to the Lord. Now listen to the process. When I look to Christ, I entrust him with things. But I also disclose to him all things. See, many of you, you'll say, well, I need somebody to talk to. That's what I never do. Don't fall for that. If the world teaches that. Well, well Sonny, you got to have someone you have to talk to. Now, who told everybody that? Somebody explain that to me. Show me that biblical principle, please. Where's that at? Why does the world give advice like that? And we take it so willingly and add it to our knowledge and spew the same vomit. Well, you got to have somebody you got to talk to that got me in so much trouble. Are you kidding? No. The Lord told me I can talk to him. That's precisely what I do. See, because whoever you talk to and confide in, that's who you're looking for something from. Do you hear me? You're going to be looking to that person for something. You're going to need some type of return. I found out something. People, they can't return to me what I'm looking for. Not directly. They can't do that. God can orchestrate it, but I can't, I cannot look to a person, wrap them up in chains, and every day look them in the eye and say, you got what I want back from you? No, I can't do that. You don't just say it like that. It's subconscious or something. Man. But you guys get the gist of it. Now, when you open up yourself to Christ, when you talk to Christ, just like you would talk to me or somebody else, right? Because I do not go to the Lord and say, Thou greatest of all who was great. I don't do that. I'm not it. I, I don't talk like that normally. Why is it that people start talking to old English? Anyway, I address the Lord with my honesty. He taught me to do that in a very uh, corrective way. There, was, there were some times I said some big phony prayers. You know, that they sounded beautiful, but they were as phony as baloney is real meat, they were phony. They were phony. You know, a, a real prayer is when you're saying, Lord, I, I need your help, and you got a tear coming out your eye, and you're fidgeting with your fingers because you're in trouble, and you don't know what to do, and your heart is palpitating, and you say, Lord, please help me. And that's a real prayer. That's a real one. That's a real one right there. Yes, sir, that is. If I can orchestrate a prayer and say the perfect words, that's done for others' ears. When you address the Most High, He heard you before you ever spoke a thing. So, the world has taught us, listen, to compose our prayers. Listen to me carefully. And to go with it. But how many times have you approached Christ with a composed prayer and did not disclose to Him the absolute issues of your life, only to focus on the one thing that seemed common to all? You, get, you got people out there that are they're praying about things. Lord, help me with this. But they didn't say, Lord, I'm fully rejecting who you made me to be. I got a problem with that. I need help with that. They didn't say that. That's what they need to say. Wouldn't you think? There are people who cannot stand to look upon other races. You know what they say? They say, ah, those type people repulse me. Well, why? I don't know why. Wouldn't that be a prayer? Wouldn't you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem. These people, when I look at them, I start to, I don't, just don't like them. They look dirty to me. Help me. That'd be a true prayer. But that's not how people pray, is it? In other words, they keep the major problems. And they start talking about the obvious things. Look at the world. Look at the world. Matter of fact, look at the church that exists today. Look how many denominations are within the realm of Christianity. And show me the unity. We continue to look over the brokenness, composing some other prayer. And why? Because that's what somebody else said you should do. 
Why do we trust a person so blindly when we cannot trust Yahshua HaMashiach blindly? Why is it that we can read John John's book and believe every word and even employ the methods John John gives us, but we can't read the Bible and believe every single word and employ what they have given us? Why is it that we have access to the words of Jesus Christ but won't employ them all? Why do we need any additional knowledge when we cannot receive the knowledge put before us? Because, listen, your old family, remember them? The old people in your life that did not accept you because of your quirkiness, because of your over-kindness, because of the ways that were conducive of their lifestyle. They condemned who you were and locked you up. They made you hide your true identity in order to protect yourself. It's almost like people said, I, I can never let my true self come forward. Even right now, there are many of you right now hiding who you really are. I'm not talking about not showing your face. Forget about that nonsense. I'm saying you're not being who God made you to be yet. Because you do not trust everybody like that. You won't open up because of trust issues. You won't authentically become who you really are. Because you feel people are going to trample it underfoot. Some of you are incredibly kind. But guess what? Somebody told you you were naive. So you took your kindness that God put in you and you covered it over. You locked it away. And you said that I can't ever show this. This can only, only get me wounded. See? And so by locking yourselves away, guess what? Do you really expect to become what the Lord has put in you to become? Let me tell you what I did. I was someone else. And I thought I had to be a specific individual for the sake of many people. I threw all that nonsense away. I threw all of it away. I'm kind too. I'm, I'm kind, quirky, nerdy, sometimes quite bold. Up front, in your face, sometimes shy. But one thing is for sure, I'm no good at being anybody but me and I refuse to hide whom the Lord is raising in me. There was a time I would not talk to anybody about the Word of God like I'm doing with you. Do you know that? There were times I could see so much about people. Truth be told, you may not believe it. I stay away from a lot of human contact, I do. I know it sounds weird, but I stay away from people a lot. Do you know why? Because it was perceived when I'm around people. Like a thousand voices happening at one time in the volumes all the way up. Like emotions are pulled out from this side, that side, and every side. Now, when I was young, people would say, Stud! Get rid of that. It was very sensitive. And the ironic part is, it was normally always right on the money. I threw that away. Some of you did the same thing. You, you threw that away. You can't do that stuff. But I found out everybody wasn't like that. I stood it and suppressed it. Do you know how many times I felt the stress coming from a person and did nothing? Do you know how many times I had the solution to a person's problem? I could see it and did nothing to help them. Do you know how many times that happened? Lots. One day, reading in the Bible, that's when the stories came along. It's almost like the Lord said, what are you doing? There's a story in the Bible of a person who they locked away. We did the same thing. That's the story of us. They locked this person away. The person God sent here, they locked away. But as it turns out, it's the person that was locked away, the one who God called. That's the one who delivers everybody else. That's the one utilized for everybody else. In my case, it's my quirkiness that really helps people. The very thing people said I should not have is the very thing that is a pretty strong weapon against darkness itself. It's the very thing. You know that compassion that you have? When everybody else turned away from someone, you saw that someone like it was in slow motion, but then you turned away with a group. You chose to be like the group and ignored who God made you to be. The one who God made you to be, you would have went right over to the person who was being laughed at. You would have comforted the person they were talking about, making fun of, laughing at, doing whatever they were doing. You were. But to hide yourself in the world to survive, what did you do? You put away the person God made you to be. And you adopted what you were never meant to be. Now that you get older, you have developed that person that just came out of nowhere. But I'm telling you now, the Lord is coming back for who he made you to be. He will not come back for a stranger. No. He knows exactly who he's coming back for. He is not coming back for our invented personalities. He's not. And I decided I'm going to be who I am. And I decided that. That's when the losses happened. You kidding me? But then I compared. I said, wait a minute. 
What am I thinking about losses for? I started thinking about all my losses by becoming this figure in the world, living up to the expectations of so many different people. I would lost myself in that stuff, lost everything in that stuff. How could I lose anything else? To be that simple person the Father put here on this earth, that's who you really are, not the person you invented. He knows who he sent, and it is not the people we invented. He knows why you invented that character. Truth be told, you were surviving. But the person God put here on this earth, that's who all the gifts are for, that person. Not for the created invention of us, but for the person God put here. You know that emptiness, that disconnect you feel sometimes? Think about who you have built versus who God sent here in the first place. Think about that contrast. Listen, I guess you're wondering, why is Mike saying all this about getting back to who God made us to be? Since I'm quirky already, right? You guys are going to see a large military police response. Kind of militant. A response. A big response. You guys remember Florida? You remember all those police that showed up at the mall because of the children? You guys are going to see a pretty big response. Very similar to that. Except three times as many people. As many officers involved. And a whole lot more people. Go have their own narrative, of course. But Florida was a key event. Our father did not make a mistake in who he has sent here for this time. There is no force that will ever overwhelm a believer in Christ. If you have gone through anything that was to strengthen you, to develop you, to bring your character to the forefront, to grow you, there's been a long period of people going through things and then being able to observe what they've been through. Their time was always coming of employment, for you would have to employ those things you know of the Lord. Stand on your foundation. And we're not talking about a major trying of all humanity. No. But events, yes. Things that people are not used to, they will go through. When this gathering takes place, when you guys hear about this, it'll seem similar to, it'll be like Florida's situation. Now it may be by appearances. It may seem like something different. They can name it anything they want. But you'll get the gist of it. Things are going to go... You know how people do when they get a hold of things like this. Right? When things like this happen, they all of a sudden become the experts on it. But this will be the first of a few. And then all of a sudden it's not going to stop. Many will be wore down because they won't be able to figure out the nature of the issue. And it will keep happening. And all the while, you will notice the degradation of morality, increase in violence, irritation, aggravation, and foulness dripping out of everybody's mouth. Just remember, the Lord didn't make a mistake choosing you to be here at this time. There are others out there. Think of them as being you a long time ago, and they're out there in the world. The only way we can be effective in this time is by way of our faith. That means we're either going to have it for real, or we're going to fold. Many will give in because they'll find themselves powerless. But those who give in, listen, because do, do you guys think that Jesus tells the truth? I do. So when people stand before him and he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Do you think that's going to be a lie? I do not. If he never knew them, then they never were your brothers and your sisters. Now that's invisible right now. And that will be uncovered at the end. It's not uncovered right now. That's why we stand on that principle. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Spiritual weakness in high places. People, the person, should never be a target of you. You've been authorized and in fact empowered against the heavy duty things that will come that people will seem to have no power over. But you will. And you will know that. But the world's not going to have an answer. And you know what happens when something of a different nature encounters something of a somewhat uh, diminished nature. You know what happens. The one with a diminished nature perceives the power of the others who come and they seem to bow to them. They bend to them. With the world, when they cannot defeat something, they bow to it. They appoint it. They deify it. But from the beginning, somehow, those of you who are born of God, as it states in the Gospel of John chapter 1, somehow you knew of the others. 
I'll call them. Somehow you knew of those additional elements. See, the Lord had you in a position where you did not have a normal time all the time. You had your moments. You had your insights. You had the wacky moments when you were small when it sounded like you heard chatter. Anybody ever hear people when you were about possibly 11, 9, I say 9 to 12, and you heard people talking real fast, like real fast, and then it would go away? Anybody ever do that? Huh? Like real fast chatter, and it would go away. You really didn't, couldn't do anything. You would hear it, and you know, the moment would come on, then it's gone. Anybody ever do that? Many of you were born insightful. You have hit and misses in your life, but the truth is, you knew things. Some things did not surprise you. But when you were young, you had a deep sadness inside. You remember that? You remember how you did not like the world? You thought it was too cruel? It was a loss of love in this world. You saw it leaving, and you couldn't do anything about it. It forced you to become a survivor. Some of you probably got a multitude of fights over this because you had to become a survivor. But the truth is, you noticed love was dying in this world. You saw it, you knew it, and you could not communicate it. You couldn't even make sense of it, but you would see it, perceive it. And then you were attracted to certain subjects. Nobody initiated these subjects with you. You were drawn to them, weren't you? You know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about the Bible. Nope, we're not talking about the Bible. See, people can hide this all day. They, they can try and hide it. Like, come on, I know better. People were drawn to certain subjects. That was when you were real young. Some of you, possibly, you heard something on the radio or saw something on television, and it really drew your attention. And you were immersed in it. And you had a different imagination. As you grew, you tried to ignore it, didn't you? You tried. But every time that subject, a documentary, or something kicked in, you would find it. Until many of you had certain moments in your life when you were ready. How many here had dreams of black and white? No color, just black and white. How many? And it was weird because you really can't even quite call it a dream now, can you? But it was black and white, just black and white. How many of you remember the moments you're laying in bed and something in you knew? You knew something, like something was coming. You said, ah, it's coming. It's going to happen again. You didn't know what was going to happen again. You just said to yourself, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen. And you knew it. You never communicated that to anybody. Probably people don't know that of you to this very day. But those are no accidents. They're no accidents. Your father desires you to be in truth. Not lie and fantasy, imagination, embellished stories. But the real deal. Can't you see you've been spoon-fed something over time? Why? Because you live in this time. This is not some normal time. There is something very close to you. Very close to all of us. Now listen, the Bible says that during these times... People are going to have a rough time hanging on to life because of what they see. I've seen people burn out and blow up. When they saw certain things, that, that most people who deny things, the reason they deny them is they really do not want to deal with that subject. If they deny it violently, then they have knowledge of it. If they passively deny it because they don't believe it, they're clueless. But if they become violent and deny it, they want nothing to do with it. It scares them. So what do you think is going to happen in these spiritual things start happening. I'm going to call them spiritual. I'm going to call them what they are. When these spiritual things begin to happen all over the place, what do you think the average person is going to do? Somebody said, I, I never feel it anymore. Yeah, for some of you, it's almost like 2013 through 2015, something left. It left, didn't it? Left you alone. Everything left. Anybody have that where everything just shut down all of a sudden? It just left. Your life was a bit disrupted, wasn't it? Where they, where, what happened? Everything is like normal now. What happened? My life has not been normal. What, what turned off? What shut off? Some of you are like that. If more and more people would tell the truth, I'm talking about believers. My goodness, we could really get some ground going. We could really go into the word then. For the most part, there's a, people are still almost in a programmed mode to ignore the truthful things that happened. But I'm telling you now, the Lord may do a bit differently and a lot bolder. He did not make you to go run away. He didn't make you to duck your head in the sand. You may be timid. You may not perceive yourself as a warrior. But the Lord has preserved you. He preserved you for this time. So guess what? That, that when you were intimidated, when you had these things come over you in the presence of violence, how many had a freeze come over them in the presence of hostilities or violence? And you didn't quite understand it. I mean, it's almost like you said, wait a minute. I could take these people, but what is this? 
like something else was causing you not to get into certain things. You couldn't make sense of it. You've been preserved. See, because lots of people read prophecy. They read about demons. They read about angels. They read about the Father. They read about the Son. They read about the extraordinary events, but they don't believe them. But guess what? They will begin to open up. They will increase in frequency. They're going to throw people off. You got to get yourselves ready for a lot of people making new religions. You got to get yourselves ready for a lot of Christians. They're going to start throwing stuff into the Bible and believe a totally different way than what the Lord has put in all of you. That's why collectively, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together in the Word of God. Because what normally happens, historically, when civilizations, right before they fall, these weird religions come in. And people start gravitating towards these weird religions. Why? Because you have Christians out there right now that do not believe in miracles. And if a miracle would happen, they still can't perceive it. They can't accept it. They say, I can't deal with it. Then somebody comes along and explains it a different way. They develop cults. They're going to utilize these extraordinary events to have people believe in a bunch of nonsense. Did you ever notice in Revelation that most of the people in Revelation, they blaspheme the Father for the things that were happening? They blaspheme those that live in the heavens? Well, my question to you is, why would they blaspheme the Father for these events that are happening on earth? I'll tell you why. Because they knew they were coming from the Father. See, if you, if you ask the average person where are all these storms coming from, they're going to have a scientific answer. They're not going to say, well, God's doing this. They're not going to be angry at God for doing that. Those who believe something is soon to happen. Many of those who believe now will not believe then. They won't. Those are the ones. Those are the ones that will blame God. They will mock him, cast his name down. They'll put everything on him and say he's doing this, and they still will not yield nor repent. Because they once knew him. It's kind of like a person who goes to church and follow the Lord and then something happens. They become an atheist. They say, why are you an atheist? Now, why would a loving God take my wife away? That's why I'm an atheist. All of them have stories like that. They're hurt. They're deeply hurt. And so they hate God. Many of you have been through moments in your life where you were not happy with the Father. You still believed and you were angry. You were bold and silly enough to be angry at the living God like you had lost your mind. So think about people of whom Christ did not call back. Who would you have become if that hatred would have continued to stir? If the Lord would have left you alone, not educated you to the truth, and let you begin to build upon whatever you were starting to believe. If he didn't call you back home, you would have been lost in the sauce with a lot of hatred toward the heavens. you got to get yourselves ready for that. When people do not get their way, when their paradigm does not come true, when they get violent and angry, that's when you find out who they are. Listen to me. Please listen to me. You don't know if a person is good or evil. Until you see that person and things are not going their way, then you find out who they are. If somebody truly belongs to the living God and things are not going their way, they do not lash out at everybody. No, they inquire of the Lord. They repent. They refine their lives. They do a lot, but they do not lash out at everybody else. Those who become violent and others, sure they're hurt, but it's in your pain and in your hurt and in your distress, that's when you convey who you truly are. Thank God that happened to you early in life, that you were able to go and say, Lord, help me with this person. That's in me. Get these ways away from me. But I tell you, now you're going to see men rebel in their own violence. And they'll call that violence purity. They'll justify it. Now is that time. You'll begin to see who is who, and you will not like it. But the Lord did not make a mistake putting you in this time. Somebody says, Mike, you know something about the issue with split personalities from birth on all parts of yourself? Sure I do. I know the world uses that term split personality. I understand what they're trying to say. But you see, they're, they're, they're diagnosing a behavioral pattern absent the spirit. In so doing, they err in their interpretation of what's actually happening to the person. The Father sent us here to be delivered, to be fully delivered. In order to do that, all of us had to be born in bondage. All of us were born into a world full of sin, into darkness. Now, in that darkness, many things were attached to us. Many things were in the families we were born from. All of us went through this. Listen to me, as we overcome these things, that's when we become strong. And it just so happens, hear me, 
the very thing you have to overcome is the very thing you are to excel in. So, for example, suppose a person is born into a family full of abuse. Now, that person, when they overcome the abuse, it just so happens God called them to intercede in the lives of all those who are abused. So, of course, they were going to be born into abuse. And as they are delivered from the wounds, and as they are delivered from that stigma, and as they begin to acquaint themselves with the living God and start seeing the actual spirit, they become a weapon against darkness that darkness can no longer stop. As it turns out, that's why Jesus had to be tried, didn't he? Everything must be tried. Everything that is of value is going to be tried by the fire. And your life is that fire. So people are born with many things, and sometimes in your family line, there are generational curses that marked you. But guess what? You're sent here to overcome everything. Do you hear me? Everything. So these problems and these issues that people face and have and are trying to get over, that's why we continue and encourage to continue, because when you overcome that thing, then you have overcome. You can overcome everything else in life. If you don't overcome that one thing, you didn't overcome anything. It's kind of like that person you can't get rid of in your life. The person that keeps coming back. The person you pray that the Lord would take away out of your way. That you'd never see that person again. And yet, they continue to pop up in your life. And you're saying, well, what in the world? It just so happens. That is the person you find it very difficult to forgive. That is the person that can cause you to curse. That is the person that can cause you to have a fit of carnality. And then you have to go back after this person, you know, is outside of your proximity. You say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive, keep that person away from me because they're causing me to lose my footing every time they come around. The Lord is telling you, he's showing you something. Did you hear what I just said? People will say that too. That person is causing me to lose my footing when they come around. Well, let me communicate this to you. If that person can cause you to backslide, if that person can cause you to sin, you can't even face Satan, can you? If a person can cause you to go against Yahshua HaMashiach, you have no chance against the devil. Do you hear me? So when you overcome that person and can maintain who you are in Christ, then you have overcome all darkness. That person is a gauge in your life. Oh, and guess what else? There's always the icing on the cake. That same person that keeps coming around that seems like they know exactly what to say to get you going. They know exactly what to do to get you out of sorts. That same person. Have you ever noticed they don't listen to anybody? Have you noticed that? They don't let everybody has told you they don't listen to anybody. Do you know why? Because you're the one appointed to speak to them. If you don't overcome that person, who you're in trouble. But if you do, through you, they will glorify Christ. That goes all these things we suffer with, they're not mistakes. They are not mishaps. They are critical. They can only be overcome by the word of God. You should know that by now. They can't be overcome any other way. You know, and that makes us real. Because to overcome it, you've got to be real. To get through it, you've got to be real. You've tried. People have tried every alternative. And everything has failed. Being saved delivered you. Remember that, being saved and delivered. I can tell you this, if you listen to the world and believe what they say, well, you'll even forget we had this discussion. Seek the Lord when it happens. Have an understanding that we are in the end times. Don't make, don't add to it, don't make up anything. If you don't understand it, don't communicate it, don't communicate it to anybody else. When it takes place, there'll be much more to say. Get ready for it. Because a lot of people are not going to be ready for it. And you'll see what happens when things really catch people off guard. But most importantly, you're not a mistake nor a mishap. You're highly purposed to be here. Our Father is going to help clarify why you're here. That's why these years of demonstration had to come. They had to come. Because if these years of demonstration did not come, people would continue to tell you what is favorable to them. The Lord has already answered many of your questions. All you have to do is revisit what's been happening in your life to see the truth of the whole thing. Do you know that? Someone said, Mike, considering what you said, what you do when it's like someone literally goes out of their way to give you a hard time of keeping your distance isn't necessarily the answer. Yeah. Well, maybe a confrontation. I'll tell you something. If a person was possessed and came to you harassing you, 
What is your defense? Anybody know? What's your defense? You know what? Demonic entities influence people's minds. That's why the Bible says, take captive of your thought. They're quite active here on the earth. They cause anybody in a moment of weakness to do a myriad of things always against you. So how do you fight that? You fight darkness with love itself. How do you do that with a person you don't even know? Be reminded they're a human being and something is using. Always look and be reminded that the Lord gave them life too. You want to really get rid of a dark entity? Realize the Father's work in a person. Realize that. Because when you realize God made them too, God gave them life too, that they're breathing because they're in an era of grace and mercy, you're already defeating the darkness within that person. Demons want you to act outside of grace and mercy. I'll say it one more time. Demons want you to act outside of grace and mercy. Never forget that. There will come a time for grace and mercy. No, there's going to be something else. That's when you will be a thousand percent authoritative. But right now they want you to operate outside of grace and mercy. They know what their master is about to do. They know about their master's timing. They want you to operate outside of grace and mercy so they can commence with their sufferings upon your life. Don't fall for that. Because if they win through a vessel against you and you step outside of grace and mercy, it's not only going to be you who may lose something, but it will be the person that demonic entity is using. If you stay within grace and mercy, you defeat the evil using that person against you. See how that works? You want to fight the good fight? Walk as your Lord walked. Obey Yahshua HaMashiach. That's what you do. You don't know how to respond to somebody. Look at how Jesus responded. Start looking at him. Start walking behind him. All of you have a Bible. You have an ability to walk behind them. Just read the gospel and start seeing your Lord and Savior. It's also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.